Uh, welcome everybody. Um, welcome to the talk uh, that we uh, present or will present today: banking observability at scale. Uh, my name is Arjen Luiken. I'm a father of two, and in the weekend I'm uh, a volunteer at a dog school where I teach uh, students about dog behavior and uh, training. And uh, with me is yeah, I'm uh, Salvatore Vitale. I'm Italian, living in the Netherlands for um, around 10 years. If you wonder if I speak any Dutch, just a little bit to get uh, some information at the kindergarten about my two years uh, daughter. That's it. I hope that uh, she will help me with the Dutch in the future. And uh, I'll let Arianna continue the Thank you. Talk. Uh, we are here on behalf of the ING. Uh, the ING is uh, a bank uh, with a global uh, presence, but uh, by far the biggest presence that we have is in uh, Europe. So our job within the organization, um, and that's quite an interesting job, uh, because only uh, two years ago, I guess, we were still using uh, monitoring systems like uh, Tivoli, HP OpenView, and we basically identified that uh, open source was the way forward. So we started working, and um, what we um, uh, want to provide is uh, a self-service platform for our engineers, so that they can uh, simply spin up uh, the observability that they need. Um, in order to uh, design such a system, we had to think about some concepts behind the design. And basically what we did, uh, if um, you're probably familiar with the optotelemetry and the pipeline within the, the collector, basically what we did is take that uh, pipeline and basically take it out single process and spread it out over multiple uh, processes. Uh, the first stream um, that we um, identified was uh, metrics, and that's uh, what this talk today is about. Um, if we talk about uh, design drivers, yeah, everybody uh, knows about uh, scalability and those kind of things. The thing that I really want to highlight today is the architecture building blocks, uh, because everybody knows that in an enterprise it makes sense to reuse uh, those uh, building blocks, but even more so in the bank, uh, because there's a thing called risk and compliance and we are very concerned about risk and compliance. So if you walk uh, on our floor where we work, you heard things like uh, risk appetite, uh, risk controls, in control statements, uh, risk scores. So that means that if you design a system within a bank, you have basically a choice, right? Reuse the architectural building blocks where the risk is managed for you by a different uh, team, the secondary operations are uh, managed, or roll your own. So basically it's a trade-off between uh, the best technical solution or the best solution uh, for uh, the bank and also for the effort that you have in order to support your system. Um, so today uh, we're going to talk about how we handle metrics. Um, so we created a self-service uh, platform for this and we like to call that uh, the reliability toolkit uh, together with um, a single view. So before we dive into uh, how we solve the um, the, the metric observability. Uh, we have some numbers. Uh, these tend to change on a day-by-day -day basis because we still have team uh, onboarding. So currently we are handling the load of around uh, uh, 5,000 uh, Prometheus uh, instances and around 1,700 uh, Grafana instances. So if you look at uh, how we handle scalability, um, basically we went the sharding route. Yeah, because each computer system has limits and it can uh, come in many forms. So an egress interface can have uh, a bandwidth uh, limit, uh, a cluster might have um, uh, limits, even uh, a metric store yeah, might have an uh, upper limit. So in order to uh, overcome those limits, uh, we shard. Uh, so basically um, we have the ING containing, uh, container hosting platform. It's in a Kubernetes uh, environment. And what we do is that we create namespaces in um, that environment. And there we have also a control plane. And the control plane is basically responsible for allocating uh, the workloads. And it can be uh, done in uh, different ways. It can be uh, uh, done, it is done with a placement policy. And the placement policy can either be like, OK, huh, uh, this team should be pinned to a specific shard, or uh, we're going to use um, the least used um, a shard that we have available uh, to us. Um, the container hosting platform is stateless. So that means we don't have um, persistent volumes. That also means that we need to store our state somewhere else. 
So what we uh, did is that we uh, deployed MIMIR in um, the ING private cloud. So MIMIR is uh, deployed in a monolithic mode on VMs. And we have a uh, hardware appliance with an uh, S3 compatible interface. And that is what we actually use to store uh, the metrics. Uh, so that handles scalability. But what, are the, what about availability? Uh, the way that we handle availability is quite simple. Uh, each time you request a uh, deployment, a logical deployment, you get actually two physical copies, one in data center one and one in data center two. Um, so let's have a look at charts and what's in there. Uh, if we zoom in uh, a bit in uh, what resides in the shard, uh, we first see the security proxy. Uh, the security proxy is something that we built in-house. And it's basically a uh, reverse proxy between uh, the Prometheus interface and the Grafana interface. So the proxy handles a couple of things. Uh, first, we present the consumer with uh, the deployments that they have access to. And also, it handles the authentication. And for that, we uh, delegate the authentication to uh, Active Directory. Uh, via uh, OpenID Connect, and uh, based on the access token that we get back. Um, in the token, we have a lot of group memberships, and what we did is that each deployment is also tagged with the different groups that uh, can have access uh, to it. And by intersecting those two pieces of information, uh, we know what to present to our consumers in the interface. Uh, then we have a couple of shared components within each uh, shard. Um, the, the thing that we use to load balance is uh, Envoy. Uh, so Envoy is uh, between uh, Prometheus and Grafana. And it's basically um, ensuring that we um, balance over our uh, member uh, cluster. Uh, then we have a uh, shared alert manager. Um, and that alert manager will um, um, forward the alerts that it uh, receives to an um, also a custom build service. That's uh, the MDPL uh, service, as, uh, as we like to call it. And this service basically has a webhook eh, that um, understands the Prometheus Alert Manager um, payload. And we use that to uh, forward the alert. Um, then we have the federation service. And the federation service is what we use to get uh, data from collecting to processing and delivery. So basically, we uh, use uh, labels. Uh, so if the consumer has a desire to use a specific capability later on in the pipeline, I think about uh, anomaly detection, error budget uh, reporting, uh, trend prediction. They can label uh, their uh, data set with a specific label. It will be picked up by um, the Federation service, and the Federation service will use remote write to write to that same MDPL uh, service. That MDPL service will forward all the data it receives to Kafka, and um, Kafka is used then to uh, transport um, certain metrics uh, to uh, the different capabilities, huh? for example, the uh, long-term metric store, uh, because we have actually multiple MIMR clusters. Uh, we want to uh, keep tabs on the footprint that we have as uh, uh, a company on monitoring data. So basically what we uh, expect our users to do is that certain metrics that should be uh, kept for a longer uh, retention period should be labeled so that we move that data to uh, a different store where they have a much higher uh, retention. Uh, then we have a custom uh, alerting backend, and of course our analytics and um, reporting uh, capabilities. So that uh, concludes the overview. Now uh, my colleague will uh, show you something more about the orchestration. Yes. Thanks, Adrian. So yeah, let's dive a bit uh, into the, some technical aspect of uh, what we want to focus today, which is basically how we provide Prometheus and Grafana as a service to our uh, engineers. As Ariane mentioned today, we actually have, we maintain almost uh, uh, 5,000, uh, 6,000 uh, Prometheus and uh, almost 2,000 uh, Grafanas. Um, so how this works, on the left you, saw, you, you, you see like the, the engineer that is basically communicating or sending a, a request to what we call the resource manager, a resource manager. This resource manager, always following the approach that he was uh, highlighted by um, Barian at the beginning of this talk, is that is a component within ING that we want to reuse. 
Um, and it's basically, it's called, uh, in ING, it's called Touchpoint Automation Framework. And if you want to know more, some engineers at the ING booth uh, from tomorrow on will actually explain about it a bit more. But basically it works like a sort of Kubernetes uh, API where you can send a manifest and this manifest uh, has some uh, resource definitions, and then the resource manager is aware of what sort of uh, uh, resource uh, the user, the consumer in this case, the engineer wants to create. Uh, the resource manager actually uh, extracts some, uh, some uh, let's say, some um, uh, logic, and does some logic for us. First of all, it does all the authorization and the authentication. So again, against uh, the ID uh, that Tarian showed in the previous slide. But also, he runs an open agent uh, policy. So he has, as a actually provider of a service, we can use open agent, um, let's say, well, they're called Rego files, to specify what kind of constraint we want to put on, uh, on the resource. For example, one of the constraints we have is that if the resource is actually for a production environment, we would like to have at least four I principle. So another engineer or another uh, team member needs to approve the, the pipeline with which the, re, the resource will be either created, updated, or deleted. Um, after that, after the resource manager has done his job, so received the request, he knows it's a, like either a, a Prometheus resource or a Grafana resource that he wants to create, he sends it into our queue, where our control plane, where we have our controller, pick up the message, do some extra validation, and then if everything is all right, he stores the state uh, into our the DB, and then he sends a message to the orchestrator in the shard with the list, uh, uh, either with the list uh, utilization or either with some uh, dedicated utilization, uh, dedicated service that we want for particular teams. Let's say we have platform teams like uh, the Kafka teams or other teams that require like a highly uh, amount of, uh, of pods. So for them, for those kind of, uh, of team, we would like to have like dedicated chart. Uh, the orchestrator then sp spins up a pod, which communicates actually with the Kubernetes API, and actually creates either a Prometheus or a Grafana pod, depends on what uh, the consumer is requesting. And then uh, the user can actually, uh, at this point, uh, use the, Kuber the, um, the, sorry, the resource manager CLI uh, to actually request what is the status of his, uh, of his request, if it has been completed. And then once it's completed, you see that the the status is incompleted, he can actually log to the uh, login into the security proxy where he will see an overview and, uh, this, and basically he will see if his Grafana or Prometheus are ready, on a state ready and they can be basically start, uh, he can monitor basically and can visualize and access the UI of Grafana and Prometheus. But this is nice on, uh, on paper, so we have prepared a small demo for this. Um, before, which, in which I basically will show exactly this process uh, from the engineers, but uh, by using the CLI. I would like to basically uh, say a bit what the demo of the scope would be. So in this, in this demo, we will create uh, a Prometheus uh, instance using the resource manager CLI. Then we create a second Prometheus instance. Um, just to highlight out the, the, the fact that scraping is completely uh, decoupled from uh, visualizing. Then we will start a Grafana instance uh, where basically this Grafana will have automatically access to the, to the data scraped by the Prometheus instance that were previously created. And finally, we'll, we will apply also using the resource manager at dashboard. And uh, before starting, I would like to mention that we will refer to Prometheus internally as a reliability toolkit too and to Grafana as a single view, which is basically our internal name for, uh, for the resource manager uh, definition. And finally, we will not use the kubectl, but as I said, we will use the touchctl, which is the internal uh, uh, the product that we use at ING. Okay, I'm going to the, yeah, to avoid issue with, uh, with VPN and stuff, uh, security, you know, in the bank. So I, will, I just recorded, uh, but you can trust that this video has not been uh, <laughs> manufactured, this reality. <laughs> I can show it to you later in case. <laughs> so let's start. This is a reality video toolkit too, so it's a Prometheus um, uh, resource sure. definition. And then, oh, sorry. It's not uh, showing. Good, Ariane, good catch. Why not? Uh, maybe I need to exit the um, presentation mode. Okay, good catch. Yes. And show. Yeah. Yes. 
Okay, I'll start yeah. again. Yeah, good catch, guys. You were losing a lot of nice information. We, yes. Okay. So I will start with a Prometheus resource definition. So this is a Prometheus resource definition. You can see here some similarity to a Kubernetes manifest, where basically most is just uh, the resource definition that the resource manager needs. Here I'm giving a name, which is uh, the demo for the conference. Um, then we have, some spe we have some specs regarding basically the deploy the model, where in which region our consumers want to redeploy. Then we have some, um, some configuration you will recognize, the Prometheus configuration. Uh, in this case, we are, for the, for the sake of this, we are just scraping Prometheus himself. Uh, then we have some alerting. In this case, we want to be alerted if the Prometheus itself is down. Uh, let me just put this up. Sorry, guys. Um, as you can see here, I'm using the touch CTL, CTL and I'm applying actually the manifest. You can see that this, the, it returns like that the state is impending. So after that, I can actually uh, retrieve the state of my request with a get um, command. And uh, here I'm, I'm basically seeing that my request has been completed and has been deployed to shard 13 where I can, basically I can access Shard 13, where I have my overview page, and here I can see that uh, the pods is spinning up, and uh, I can monitor it until uh, basically we'll be in a ready state. Here I'm actually creating a second instance, which is exactly the same, so I'm not, uh, just the name is different, so I'm not actually uh, um, yeah, bothering you again with the, with the, with the manifest. And again, here we are seeing that the first instance actually is already on, uh, on uh, ready state, while the second is currently being spinned up by, by uh, Kubernetes. Now it's ready, so actually we can uh, dive into the, a bit into the Prometheus uh, UI. Here we will look at uh, the configuration. You can see that, in fact, uh, uh, Prometheus is uh, uh, scraping exactly the, itself on, uh, in the localhost. Then automatically, of course, we configure the remote write to our Mimir um, uh, cluster. So that's completely managed. And then you will see also that the uh, simple alert that I put in place is, uh, is there. So the first two steps, so we have two Prometheus, so now we can go to, the, to create a Grafana instance. Again, another manifest, where most of it is basically the uh, boilerplate for the resource manager. In this case, uh, we call it yeah, single view for the demo. And again, in this case, we have a simple, uh, yeah, simple manifest because the specs are just the deployment model because uh, all the other logic is handled by us. So I don't need to make it simple basically for our engineers. Again, we apply uh, the manifest using the apply uh, model, apply command. The first, we get again uh, status pending. And now if I go to the, to the proxy for, a graph, for the single view, I see that my pod is basically uh, getting into a ready state and now I'm ready. So the, you, the consumer now can access the Grafana for the first time. And then here he, he will have like a default dashboard in which you will see in his data source which are which Prometheus he can access. So here you can recognize that he will access the, this Grafana automatically has access to the two Prometheus that I previously created. And now basically I have the data. I want to create a simple dashboard just to show that all this has a sense and works. So now we have another resource definition. Basically the engineer has already created a dashboard, exported into JSON and then applied via uh, this CLI. Uh, we need to say in which Grafana instance we want to apply this, uh, this dashboard. And then you basically, yeah, this is just a JSON. Um, and then um, once the dashboard is applied, it will be uh, shown in a few seconds in your the Grafana. And now uh, you have basically this dashboard which has been uh, applied. And you can see that, in fact, uh, for very few minutes already, the, the two Prometheus are producing data. And then... Uh, basically these data are available. Of course, an engineer in ING has way more complicated uh, uh, targets to scrape and way more complex dashboard, but for the sake of the presentation, this basically explains the entire flow that uh, our engineers follow. And of course, our engineers, they don't use actually the command line, but they use the pipeline version of it that we run on our cloud. Uh, so this basically concludes the demo. I go again to presenting mode. 
guess. So, I got to, yeah, next step. So basically, uh, in the, for the coming future, short term, what we would like to do is to migrate all our recording rules and uh, alerting uh, to, the, to Mimir. Uh, for that, we are waiting for, to have the possibility to actually run uh, Mimir on uh, micro, microservices. At the moment, as Ariane explained, uh, we are currently running it on, uh, on VMs with the monolith approach. And then, the, as, uh, yeah, in line with all, uh, let's say, the conference of today, we would like actually to move towards uh, open telemetry uh, collectors for our uh, managed solutions. And um, so that's basically the trend also for us. So we are happy that actually we saw today that we are going on the right direction. Uh, we will go in the right direction. If you follow, want to follow other talks uh, from ING, tomorrow our, uh, our colleague will be pretty busy uh, with very interesting talks. So I invite you to, if you are interested, to follow them. You can um, follow us on the yeah, various channel of ING, or yeah, we very contacted us with the, in um, on our LinkedIn that you actually find on the on the on the website of the conference, and uh, that's it. That concludes our talk. Wow, well, um, that is an awesome thing. Five thousand eight hundred Prometheus instances. That blows my mind. Um, yeah. Uh, we have a few minutes for questions. Any questions for the ING folks? Um, oh, yeah, okay, we have a question there. Based on the question, we know who's going to answer it. Yep. <laughs> Why do you need 5,300 Prometheus instances? Uh, that's a um, good question. Um, it depends on the what, what, um, no, no, no. The, the thing is, um, we concern ourselves with least privilege, right? So if we would collect all the data, put it in one big bucket, then basically everybody could sue, see potential sensitive data. So uh, within our uh, IAM model, uh, we made it uh, explicit that we want to separate uh, uh, yeah, the team, basically what the team can see. So basically each team gets its own Prometheus instance, and maybe not only one, uh, but multiple, right? If they have a large environment and they want to uh, monitor a large environment, one team might have even have like uh, five uh, instances. Now, then we have also um, test development acceptance, eh? so they might spin up multiple containers for multiple purposes for multiple um, environments. And then that number, yeah, sums up quite quick. Yeah, but to give you some numbers, for example, I think, uh, yeah, the Cassandra team, uh, which is a managed database for the entire bank, uh, use uh, like maybe 25 Prometheus for their own service. Because they are owner of maybe 25 million time series. Active time series. Any other questions? Oh yeah, we have one here. Uh, hi. Oh. Um, why did you decide to wrap all the CRDs in your custom CRDs? What are the properties that they are giving you? Um, when we started to design the system, uh, we had two choices. We could either uh, use something that was already available uh, within uh, our organization, or we could uh, roll our own. Um, the idea at first was to just use operators, uh, like you uh, suggest, and then just uh, apply the, the, the resource uh, definition on the operator level. Uh, but due to um, this, this risk and, and uh, compliance, uh, teams tend to uh, restrict and the, the openness of a system, right? To, to ensure that uh, we as a, a bank can stay in control of what happens uh, with that system. And then, yeah, it's a trade-off, right? Like, okay, are you going to provision your own Kubernetes instance? Do you have the engineers to do the second day ops for that uh, instance? Uh, do you have the engineers to do risk and uh, compliance? Uh, uh, do the pen tests uh, each um, uh, regular interval? Uh, do the um, uh, evidencing of all the risk? So it's basically, um, yeah, what I, what I mentioned earlier, it's, it's this trade-off between using something that's already within the bank or yeah, uh, rolling your own solution. Cool. Um, we are out of time, uh, but yeah, the speakers will be around. Uh